Hey Optimancers, Chris here. I recently did a video where I did a tier ranking for fighters uh, and I put Arcane Archer uh, in the bottom half uh, but actually the most of the comments I had were mentioning that it probably should have even been lower than I had ranked it. So let's take a look at the Arcane Archer and I'll see if I can explain why I think you can make a decent Arcane Archer in Dungeons and Dragons that is going to be able to pull its weight. Hi, if you like the content on this channel and you would consider supporting me, please do so through Patreon. You'll find a link to my Patreon page in the video description. If you are a patron of this channel, you'll get to see these videos early and you'll get to see them without YouTube ads. Today I want to thank some of my top level patrons. So thank you to Brett McDowell, Artharazone, CJ, Chris Coons, Christian, Christian Windham, Unknown Watcher, Daniel Sturgeon, Dank Train, Dash Panther, and Dave Peters. Thank you all so much for your support. Let's get going. So some of the comments I had about the Arcane Archer were that the Arcane Archer really hurts in the 6 to 8 expected encounter design in 5th edition. So if you are familiar with my videos, uh, normally when I do builds, I assume an eight encounter day and I only assume one short rest. So we're going to put the Arcane Archer to the test today. And I just got this comment yesterday. I feel like it is a subclassless fighter. The magic arrow stuff is never going to come into effect because it doesn't work with hand crossbow. So this commenter is assuming that hand crossbow is so much better for a fighter that with an arcane archer you are still better off going with crossbow even though it doesn't work with their features. In fact they say because it specifically prescribes you have to use all your stuff with a long or short bow so you have to spec to an inferior option and probably skip crossbow expert and go into something like of an accuracy sharpshooter but nothing's giving you advantage and that's true there is nothing giving you advantage with Arcane Archer. Now, if you are making a character that somebody else is going to give you advantage somehow, then maybe you can make that work. Or maybe you can make it work with Kobold and use Pack Tactics. But let's assume we're not going to go for any tricks to try to get advantage and see how we do with the Arcane Archer. I did the math and frankly, as far as I'm concerned, the Arcane Archer can pull its weight in a party I am not here to tell you that the Arcane Archer is the best archer in Dungeons and Dragons. I'm not here to tell you that the Arcane Archer is a better archer than the Battlemaster. Uh, but I do think it does have some advantages over the Battlemaster, and we'll go over those as well. So I'm going to make an Arcane Archer build. It isn't going to be an overly fancy one, but what we are going to do is the math. And we're going to see exactly how the Arcane Archer holds up against a fighter that just takes crossbow expert, sharpshooter, and a hand crossbow. And we're going to go over some of the advantages of playing an arcane archer over such a fighter. So with this character, we're just going to take the straight and narrow path for an archery build. So our character's name, the straight and arrow path. We require no extra content here. We do not need any source books based on campaign worlds. We don't need optional class features. We don't need customize your origin. We don't need any of those things. We're going to go straight forward with race and variant human. Uh, now I've picked up Elvish with this character and ability score increases to dexterity and intelligence. We're going to pick up stealth for our skills and our free feat is going to be sharpshooter and that shouldn't be a surprise. First level, we will be a fighter. Uh, that of course gives us d10 hit points per level. It's going to give us two proficiencies. I'm going to take acrobatics and perception. We're going to get a fighting style. Of course, this must be archery. You have no flexibility there. And we are going to get second wind. So this is going to give us a bonus action on our turn where we can regain some hit points equal to a d10 plus our fighter level. Scaling on this isn't great. It's actually pretty good at level one. Uh, but, you know, by level 10 or so, it's not terrible, but it isn't so dramatic anymore. With ability scores, going to max out dexterity and intelligence. We're going to put a 14 in constitution. That's enough to get by on an archery build. 
uh, because we're not going to be in melee or hopefully not in melee. Uh, and then we have two points left. I'm going to throw them in wisdom, get our wisdom up to 10. Uh, wisdom is a common saving throw in this game. So our starting ability scores will be Strength 8, Dexterity 16, Constitution 14, Intelligence 16, Wisdom 10, and Charisma 8. Now I've grabbed the soldier background for this character. It doesn't matter. Take whatever background you figure works for your character. And at level 1, we're going to want to pick up a longbow. And if our DM lets us roll for gold, we should be able to get a longbow and studded leather armor. If not, you're going to need to stick with leather armor at level 1 and then grab studded leather as soon as you can. It's not that expensive. That's going to end up giving you an armor class of 15 and your longbow strikes are plus 7 to hit for d8 plus 3 or using sharpshooter plus 2 to hit for a d8 plus 13. We're going to have essentially a 600 foot range with sharpshooter of course. Long range doesn't impose disadvantage and there's no bonuses for cover. The damage at this level will be 8.10 on your turn on average. This has been calculated using my standard method for calculating damage, which is in the video description. I've got a link to a video that it goes through the process. But the quick math here, plus three dex, plus two from proficiency bonus, plus two from archery, minus five from sharpshooter, gives a total plus two to hit, which I calculate to be a 45% chance to hit. D8 is a 4.5 on average, plus 3 dex, plus 10 sharpshooter, is 17.5 damage on a hit, meaning 7.88 on average. Once we calculate criticals, that adds another 0.22, giving us 8.10. When I calculate damage on a build, I compare it to a baseline. That baseline is a warlock using Eldritch Blast. They maximize their charisma, they raise their charisma at every opportunity, and they are using the Hex spell. And they will grab Agonizing Blast at level 2. Uh, and this gives okay damage. It's not a great amount of damage, but it's not a terrible amount of damage. And that's why I use it as my baseline, and it scales fairly consistently as you go up in level. At level 1, my baseline is 5.68. That means this is 43% over baseline. Now what I want to do here is I also want to do a mathematical comparison not just to the baseline but also to what if we took a fighter and took crossbow expert and then as soon as we could we took sharpshooter and then raised our dexterity uh, because essentially we're giving up something by going arcane archer and I talked about that a little bit in the introduction. We can't use crossbow expert and a hand crossbow and still take advantage of arcane archer features. Now we could still take crossbow expert at level one and we could use a hand crossbow until we became an arcane archer, uh, but it doesn't seem worthwhile because you can't switch out your feats. So you're stuck with this feat that you're not using and it puts everything else behind. Uh, so I think we're better off going straight with longbow, but I want to show you the math so you can make those determinations for yourself. At this point, if we were using a crossbow expert and a hand crossbow, We'd have a plus three dexterity modifier, plus two archery, plus two proficiency bonus. We'd be looking at a 70% chance to hit. We'd also be firing twice per round because we could use our bonus action to fire. Uh, and we're not using our bonus action for anything else right now except maybe uh, second wind, which is once per short rest. And our base damage is lower. It's 3.5 because we're using a hand crossbow, plus three for dexterity, and that's it. So 6.5 times 70% chance to hit is 4.55 plus critical damage. It ends up being 4.73 per bolt times two, 9.46. So 9.46 damage with crossbow expert or 8.1 damage with longbow and sharpshooter. Notice the damage there is higher, but it's maybe not as much higher as you might have expected. Uh, and that's just because sharpshooter does add a lot of damage. Um, and the other thing I want you to remember is there is some benefit to going with longbow here, and that is mainly range. At this point, if we had gone crossbow expert, we wouldn't have sharpshooter. That means with a hand crossbow, you have a 30-foot range until you start getting disadvantaged for range penalties. With a longbow, we have 600-foot range, so that's 20 times more range. Not that you ever need 600 feet, but you often need more than 30. We're going to do a couple levels at a time. So we're going to go to level 3, and at level 2 we will get Action Surge. I'm sure most of my viewers know what Action Surge does, but 
once per short rest, you can basically get an extra action on your turn. For us right now, that's one arrow. Then we will get our martial archetype, and that is going to be Arcane Archer. First is Arcane Archer Lore. We are going to choose an additional skill. I'm going to grab Arcana, um, but nature doesn't really matter. Uh, and then you're going to choose a spell. It's going to be Druid Craft or Prestidigitation. I'll take Prestidigitation. Uh, so I'm going more the, I guess, the wizardy route. But, I mean, when it comes to magic, Arcane Archers aren't really spellcasters. Prestidigitation is mostly a flavor spell. Then we get Arcane Shot. So at third level, you learn to unleash special magical effects with some of your shots. When you gain this feature, you learn two Arcane Shot options of your choice. Once per turn, when you fire an arrow from a short bow or long bow. So this is important, you cannot use a crossbow. As part of the attack action, you can apply one of your Arcane Shot options to that arrow. You decide to use the option when the arrow hits the creature, unless the option doesn't involve the attack roll. You have two uses of this ability, and you regain all expended uses of it when you finish a short or long rest. You gain an additional Arcane Shot option of your choice when you reach certain levels in this class, 7th, 10th, 15th, and 18th level. Each option also improves when you become an 18th level fighter. So this would be a good time for me to explain why I didn't give the Arcane Archer a very high rating when I did class tier ranks, and the reason is because you don't get enough arcane shots. Yeah, there are other penalties for playing an arcane archer. If we want to use our subclass features, we're not using hand crossbow along with crossbow expert. That's a disadvantage. Also, we have a DC on our features that is based on our intelligence. That is also a significant disadvantage. But the biggest disadvantage to playing an arcane archer is I just don't think you get enough of the uh, arcane shots. I mean, Maybe you get enough at level 3, maybe 2 is enough, but it should scale. And it doesn't scale until you hit level 15, and then it's kind of a dramatic scaling. Like we go from 2 shots to 5 shots, when they could be doing this much more smoothly, they could just have you at 2 shots at level 3, 3 at level 7, 4 at level 10, 5 at level 15. So basically when you're getting additional uh, arcane shot options, we're also getting additional arcane shot uses. And I think that would work much better. So we're giving all that stuff up. Why would we consider playing an Arcane Archer anyways? The reason we would consider it is because some of the Arcane Shots are exceedingly good. And how good? I mean better than any maneuver that a Battlemaster gets. Now Battlemasters get more maneuvers. They get more uses. They get four superiority dice right at level three. So I mean we have to take that into account. But when it comes to comparing Arcane Shot to Maneuvers, this is not an even trade. Arcane Shots are better. Not all Arcane Shots are better, but at least one of them is a lot better. I'm going to go over that now. Let's go over the Arcane Shot options, and I'll tell you which ones are good and which ones suck. So here's our choices. There's not a whole lot of them, so I'm just going to go through all of them. The first one is Banishing Arrow. You use Abjuration Magic to temporarily banish your target to a harmless location in the Feywild. The creature hit by the arrow must also succeed on a Charisma saving throw or be banished. While banished in this way, the target speed is zero and it is incapacitated. At the end of its next turn, the target reappears in the space it vacated or in the nearest unoccupied space if that space is occupied. And then once you reach 18th level in the class, they also take 2d6 force damage when the arrow hits. Now. What we're talking about here is we hit a creature, then we choose to apply a Banishing Arrow. They make a Charisma saving throw. If they fail, they're banished until the end of its next turn. The Banishment, mechanically, is similar to the Banishment spell. That's a fourth level spell. The duration, is, of course, is not as long, but there's no concentration here, so that is nice. And we're accessing it at level 3. Incapacitated means that if they are concentrating on a spell, that concentration is immediately and automatically broken. And the creature is going to basically lose their turn. So this is actually pretty effective. The disadvantage, of course, is the enemy is getting a Charisma saving throw. Now, if creatures do have something like Magic Resistance, where they are getting advantage on saving throws against magical spells or other magical effects, Presumably, this is a magical effect, so they would still get advantage. 
So we have to deal with the saving throw here, uh, just like a lot of spells do. And if they make their saving throw, nothing happens. But overall, I'd say this is a pretty good effect. Charisma is a pretty good saving throw to target. And if they fail, the effect is pretty dramatic. Second one, Beguiling Arrow. Your enchantment magic causes the arrow to temporarily beguile its target. The creature hit by the arrow takes an extra 2d6 psychic damage and choose one of your allies within 30 feet of the target. The target must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or is charmed by the chosen ally until the start of your next turn. The effect ends early if the chosen ally attacks the charmed target, deals damage to it, or forces it to make a saving throw. The psychic damage increases to 4d6 when you reach 18th level in the class. So you hit with the arrow, you do 2d6 extra damage, and everything else sucks. Beguiling Arrow might be the worst one of all of these. Next one, Bursting Arrow. You imbue your arrow with a force energy drawn from the school of evocation. The energy detonates after you attack. Immediately after the arrow hits the creature, the target and all other creatures within 10 feet of it take 2d6 force damage each. This increases to 4d6 when you reach 18th level. So you're going to do 2d6 extra damage. It's force damage, so it's very reliable. And creatures next to it are also going to take 2d6 damage. There's no saving throw. So nice thing here is you don't need your intelligence at all for this. There's no saving throw. They're just taking damage. It's not a lot of damage, and it's not a big area. It's automatic, and it's an addition to your arrow. So overall, this one isn't too bad. Our next one is Enfeebling Arrow. You weave necromatic magic into your arrow. The creature hit by the arrow takes an extra 2d6 necrotic damage. The target must also succeed on a constitution saving throw, or the damage dealt by its weapon attacks are halved until the start of your next turn. The necrotic damage increases to 4d6 when you reach 18th level in this class. So you do an additional 2d6 damage, and they get a saving throw, and if they fail the saving throw, their weapon damage is halved. The saving throw is the worst saving throw we could target. Constitution, having weapon damage can be decent, especially if you have one big tough enemy. Then again, if you have one big tough enemy, it's very likely to make its saving throw. So overall, I'd say even Enfeebling Arrow is one of the weaker options for Arcane Archer. Our next arrow is Grasping Arrow. When this arrow strikes its target, Conjuration Magic creates Grasping Poisonous Brambles, which wrap around the target. The creature hit by the arrow takes an additional 2d6 poison damage, its speed is reduced by 10 feet, and it takes 2d6 slashing damage the first time on each turn it moves one foot or more without teleporting. The target or any creature that can reach it can use its action to remove the brambles with a successful strength athletics check against your arcane shot save DC. Otherwise, the brambles last for one minute or until you use this option again. The poison damage and slashing damage both increase to 46 when you reach 18th level in this class. Okay, so alert. This is the most important part of this entire video. If you don't listen to any other part of this video, listen to this part. You might have just listened to the description I made for Grasping Arrow, heard poison damage, and then dismissed the rest because you thought, you know what, poison damage isn't very reliable. Lots of creatures are immune to poison. In response to that, I'd say, if every single creature you fight in your entire campaign is immune to poison, and they won't be, most creatures aren't immune to poison, but let's say they are, this is still not only far and away the best arcane shot we can make, it is magnitudes better than any maneuver a battle master can make. Magnitudes better. And we'll hear the comparisons. Uh, when somebody wants to explain why arcane archer is bad, they'll compare to a battle master and explain, you know, I could just make a battle master archer, and first off, I can take crossbow expert and use a hand crossbow. And that's valid, right? That is a valid point. Uh, but then they'll say, and I get four superiority dice. My maneuvers are based on DCs that are on strength or dexterity, which I'm increasing anyways. Arcane archers only get two arcane shots. Those are based on intelligence, which is not my primary ability score. And that's not a good comparison. That is a completely invalid comparison because arcane shot is magnitudes better than maneuvers because of grasping arrow. Uh, so let me explain why this is so, so good. Uh, so first off, we hit a creature with an arrow. Then we apply the arrow damage. Then we apply grasping arrow. Let's say the creature is immune to poison. So it takes zero poison damage. Now the rest of grasping arrow 
automatically works. No saving throw. Okay, so first thing, their speed is reduced by 10 feet for up to a minute. I mean, it could very well be a minute, but it may be less. We'll talk about that. Uh, so if it had, say, a 30-foot movement speed, now it's 20. That's not the end of the world, but it does hurt. And so that's not nothing. Uh, but then the real big problem. The first time it moves on each turn, it takes 2d6 slashing damage. Now, this is a magical effect, so that slashing damage is magical. That's reliable damage. I mean, super reliable damage. Uh, and when a creature moves on a turn, so it's not necessarily having to use its own movement. That means forced movement applies. And on each turn means that we have a round. We have many turns on a round. This creature can take that damage many times every round. And if you play with optimizers or you watch this channel, you'll see that with builds, force movement is just kind of a standard these days. Not every build uses force movement, but boy, a lot of them do these days. Uh, spellcasters take the telekinetic feat, and that way they can, you know, push creatures into their webs. Uh, you know, warlocks, they will use repelling blast with their eldritch blast to push creatures into effects. Uh, so we have melee characters, they're using the crusher feat to move creatures, no saving throw. Uh, we have swarmkeeper rangers, they're using gathered swarm to move creatures. We have grapplers, they're grappling and dragging things. Uh, and I could go on and on and on and on. Uh, and the reason why is because there's so many ways to deliver force movement these days. And there's so many good things we can do with it. So it's just kind of common. And that means if we didn't do anything on our turn, or we didn't use Arcane Shot at all, then our allies are still force movementing the enemies. So we're going to hit the biggest, toughest, nastiest creature in the fight. And again, we don't care about poison immunity or resistance. It does not matter. We hit the biggest, toughest creature. We apply Grasping Arrow. Now the rest of the characters are going to do what they're going to do, which is moving this creature around to do their various force movement uh, combinations. And each time they do so, it takes an additional 2d6 damage, no saving throw. Uh, so let's just say that we got lucky in initiative order. So we went and then maybe we have four of our allies going and then the creature we hit is going. And let's say those four allies all do force movement. That's 8d6 damage before this creature's turn even comes up. That's a lot of damage. Uh, but now the creature's turn comes up. And now it has to make a choice. It can either continue to live with the debilitating effects of Grasping Arrow, which are tearing it apart, or it can try to get rid of it. But if it tries to get rid of it, it has to use its action to do so. So it's losing its turn. I mean, it can still move, but of course it's taking additional damage when it moves. But it's losing its turn. It just lost its turn. And then it might not get rid of the effect anyways. Even if this automatically got rid of the effect when they took an action, it would still be great. You're taking an entire turn away from the toughest creature with no saving throw. That's great, but there's a good chance they're going to fail because they get an athletics check against our DC to break it. And go ahead and take a look at your monster manual and look for all the creatures that are uh, proficient in athletics. You're not going to find very many. Most creatures don't even have any proficiencies at all, but uh, those that do, I mean, there's a chance they'll have athletics, but you're going to get a handful. Far and away, most creatures you fight will not have proficiency in athletics. That means it's a straight-out strength check. And if they have legendary resistance, too bad. It doesn't work because it's an ability check. If they have magic resistance, too bad. doesn't work. This is an ability check. Uh, never mind the ways we can actually cause penalties on ability checks. So I'm going to just ignore that. We'll assume we don't do any of that. So what's their chance of actually breaking the effect? Well, it's probably going to be in the range of 50-50. 50-50 to break the effect. So if they're lucky, they just take a ton of damage and lose their turn with no saving throw. Automatic. That's the lucky. If they're unlucky, then they'll, all that will happen, and it's still in effect, and then it all happens again. Uh, and, and even then, it's not guaranteed they'll get rid of the effect. It can last up to a minute, and I don't know why it lasts a minute. I mean, if we look at the arcane shots, 
it's kind of standard. They last for a round, but this one lasts up to a minute for some reason. And it's already the best arcane shot, but we're going to give it 10 times the duration on top of that. Uh, so this just becomes kind of unreal. This is one of the most overlooked features there is in the game. This grasping arrow. Just a fantastic feature. Like, how could somebody who gets this, how could I give them less than C on a tier ranking chart? It wouldn't make sense. This is so good. Now, the main disadvantage here, of course, is this is so good that when I use an arcane shot, I'm going to have trouble coming up with reasons not to use this every single time, and that's kind of boring. Uh, admittedly, doing the same thing over and over again, uh, that's not for everybody. I get that. Uh, though occasionally we might do something like a banishing arrow, but we're going to use this, I mean, a lot. Now, when I did damage calculations for this build, I had to decide how often creatures are going to take damage from Grasping Arrow, and that's not so easy, because it could be a ton of damage, but not necessarily. I mean, I think in a lot of cases, you're going to go, maybe there will be a couple cases of movement, and then the creature's going to waste their turn, and then they're going to get out of it, and then it's gone, right? So then, maybe it's only 2d6 damage or 4d6 damage. I went with 4d6 damage average for my damage calculations, I think that is massively conservative. But that's what I went for, so when you look at the DPR, just be aware, that's what I used. Now I said this was magnitudes better than any maneuver a Battlemaster can make. So, if you watched my uh, tier ranking, you heard me talk about the Battlemaster, and I talked about maneuvers, and I kind of mentioned the ones I thought were good. And, you know, one of the best maneuvers is uh, Menacing Attack. So let's compare Menacing Attack. Menacing attack, you deliver one superiority die of damage, and that's there's no saving throw, that's automatic. And then the creature makes a saving throw. If it makes it, that's all that happens. If it fails, it's frightened for one round. And that's the entire feature. That's a good maneuver. This is stealing turns from enemies and delivering many times more damage than that. Uh, so there's And there's no saving throw right? Uh, you know, you are maybe causing disadvantage if they fail the saving throw with the maneuver. This one, stealing turns, no saving throw. Uh, these aren't even close. And so, if you think Arcane Archer sucks, consider this a feature. Consider this feature and just make sure in your mind that somebody who can inflict this with no saving throw automatically is going to do tons of damage, steal turns from creatures. Does that really suck? I don't think so. I think you've got a pretty hard road ahead if you're going to tell me that sucks. And and then, of course, some creatures aren't immune to poison, and they take an additional 2d6, and there's that as well. So, if I'm going to make an archer in D&D, and I am considering a fighter, and I'm looking at Battlemaster, I'm looking at Arcane Archer, I'm telling you that Grasping Arrow is one of my primary considerations in that comparison. Our next arrow is Piercing Arrow. Use transmutation magic to give your arrow an ethereal quality. When you use this option, you don't make an attack roll for the attack. Instead, the arrow shoots forward in a line, which is 1 foot wide and 30 feet long before disappearing. The arrow passes harmlessly through objects, ignoring cover. Each creature in that line must make a dexterity saving throw. On a failed save, the creature takes damage as if it were hit by the arrow, plus an additional d6 piercing damage. On a successful save, the target takes half as much damage. Piercing damage increases to 2d6 when you reach 18th level in this class. This one, I'd say, is just straight out worse than Bursting Arrow. I think you're going to get more creatures in the effect of Bursting Arrow than you are in Piercing Arrow, and Bursting Arrow is not going to provide them a saving throw. The advantage, I guess, of Piercing Arrow is you don't have to make the attack roll in the first place, but I'm not convinced that's a big advantage. Part of the reason I don't think it's a big advantage is it means you're not going to get sharpshooter damage. So if you're in a hallway and you absolutely need to do at least some damage to all the creatures in the hallway, then Piercing Arrow would do the trick, but I just don't think it's good enough. I wouldn't recommend this for the standard Arcane Archer, and I think it's one of the weaker options. Then we get to Seeking Arrow. Using Divination Magic, you grant your arrow the ability to seek out a target. When you use this option, you don't make an attack roll for the attack. Instead, choose one creature you have seen within the past minute. The arrow flies towards that creature, moving around corners if necessary, and ignoring three-quarters cover and half cover. 
If the target is within the weapon's range and there is a path large enough for the arrow to travel to the target, the target must make a dexterity saving throw. Otherwise, the arrow disappears after traveling as far as it can. On a failed save, the target takes damage as if it were hit by the arrow, plus an additional d6 force damage, and you learn the target's current location. On a successful save, the target takes half as much damage, and you don't learn its location. Force damage increases to 2d6 when you reach 18th level in this class. So the main purpose of this is a creature's hiding, you don't know where they are, you fire the seeking arrow, it hits them. And so you're going to hit with this, you might learn their location only if they fail their saving throw, but one way or the other, you're not doing a lot of damage. This is pretty niche. I could see taking seeking arrow at some point with an arcane archer, but I definitely wouldn't choose it near the beginning. And I would say it's definitely in the bottom half. Finally, we have Shadow Arrow. You weave illusion magic into your arrow, causing it to occlude your foe's vision with shadows. The creature hit by the arrow takes an extra 2d6 psychic damage and must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or be unable to see anything further than 5 feet away until the start of your next turn. The psychic damage increases to 4d6 when you reach 18th level in this class. So we're doing an additional 2d6 damage, and it's a wisdom save or kind of sort of blinded i mean not blinded within melee range but blinded beyond that i mean if a creature's at range this could prevent certain spells to be cast this could cause disadvantage on attack rolls and advantage on attacks against them in fact if you do this with your first arrow and they fail their saving throw you would have advantage on your second arrow but if they do make their wisdom saving throw not a lot happens here so it's a save or kind of suck for a round uh, it's not terrible. It's kind of middle of the road. And those are all the arrows. Uh, so I think I've made it clear what I think the best arrows are, or specifically the best arrow, which is grasping arrow. When you start stealing actions, and potentially multiple actions, from even very tough enemies, that is a significant amount of control to be doing when you're an archer. So my arcane shot options... The very first one, obviously, is going to be Grasping Arrow. And then the second one I'll probably select to begin with is Banishing Arrow. Again, I think this is pretty good. Again, Grasping Arrow is my go-to, but Banishing Arrow, if I'm shooting a Spellcaster or something, I would probably look at Banishing Arrow. So, how much damage are we doing at level 3? Well, we only have two Arcane Arrows. Probably use them both every short rest. Again, when I do calculations, I assume that there's four combats between short rests, and each of those combats has four rounds. So when I'm talking about two shots per short rest, with my calculations, I'm assuming two shots over 16 rounds of combat. Now, this is deliberately more difficult than most campaigns are going to be. I hear from people all the time saying they've never heard of eight combats with one short rest well i've heard of it i've even played it uh, so it does happen so it is a worst case scenario but just understand that if your experience is that you have far fewer combats in between short rests then be aware that you will be applying more arcane shots and that is going to increase your dpr compared to the dpr i'm going to show you here and it also makes the arcane archer that uses a longbow better compared to a fighter that just uses crossbow expert along with sharpshooter. Now I had to, for my DPR calculations, guess on the amount of damage that your grasping arrows are going to do. And that's not easy to do because, as I mentioned when I was discussing it, there's a lot of variables. Um, so I'm using 4d6. So I'm assuming two instances of damage, either poison once and then the slashing damage once or maybe the slashing damage twice I think in some cases you'll do a lot more damage than that uh, but I think if a creature gives up their action then I think it's very reasonable that it might be only 46 it might even be less but I'm saying 46 on average uh, that ends up being 14 damage twice per short rest 14 damage divided by 8 we're talking about a total increase to damage of 1.75 brings us to 10.36 DPR, that's 35% over the baseline, which is at 7.65 at this point. Now, how is our crossbow expert fighter doing? Well, 
Uh, at level 2, they got their Action Surge. That is adding 0 0.42 to their damage. And that's it. So 9.88 damage DPR at level 3. You'll notice that's actually lower than what we would expect with the Arcane Archer that can actually use their arrows. So yes, not a subclassless fighter. Um, but I should just say here that although the Arcane Archer using the Longbow is briefly and by a very small amount improving over Crossbow Expert here, Crossbow Expert again is going to take the lead from levels 4 through level 6. So what are the advantages of using Crossbow Expert over Longbow at this point? Well, at this point, there are none. There are zero advantages. I guess you can fire melee. But if you want to have the better range, better damage, and be using Grasping Arrows to have foes lose their actions and speed, then we want to be using a Longbow. Uh, but the difference is going to become more dramatic as we move up in level. So let's hop on up to level 5. Of course, uh, at level 5, we're going to get extra attack with Fighter. That's going to allow us to attack twice instead of once whenever we take the attack action on our turn. And with Fighter's extra attack scale, so at 11th and 20th level, we're going to get an additional attack as well. And we're going to get an ability score improvement. Now at this point, in most cases with Archery, you're going to take Sharpshooter now. Of course, we already have Sharpshooter, so we can now increase our Dexterity. This is going to increase our chance to hit and our damage. It's also going to increase our armor class and initiative, incidentally. There's a lot less to talk about at level 5. I mean, level 5 is a good level. Extra attack is very effective. And increasing our dexterity has increased our armor class and our initiative and our dexterity bonus as well as our damage. Our total damage at this point will be 19.29 average damage per round. That's 17% over the baseline, which is now 16.5. We've lost a little bit of ground. 17% is still fairly comfortably over baseline, but that is about to change. We're about to shoot well over baseline in the next two levels. The crossbow expert fighters have pulled ahead slightly on damage, less than two, uh, but they are ahead again, uh, but that is about to change. So level seven is a big level for the arcane archer. We get an additional arcane shot option. We have grasping arrow and banishing arrow already. I'm going to suggest bursting arrow at this point, uh, just as a area of effect thing with no saving throw. It's pretty standard. You have a bunch of creatures clustered together. It might be worth it for a fair amount of damage that can be added up. At level 6, we get an ability score improvement. And what I'm going to recommend here is that we pick up a feat. And that feat is going to be the Piercer feat. The Piercer feat is a half feat, so we'll be able to increase our dexterity by 1. Once per turn, when we hit a creature with an attack that deals piercing damage, you can reroll one of the attack's damage dice. And you must use the new roll. And when you score a critical hit that deals piercing damage to a creature, you can roll one additional damage die when determining the extra piercing damage the target takes. Now, although I am recommending the Piercer Feet at this point, this is a modest recommendation. The Piercer Feet is not a great feat, but it will increase our damage. And as a fighter, we are going to have additional ability score increases beyond what we need. And if we take Piercer now instead of later, it actually fits nicer with what we're going to be doing with our ability score increases. So I do think it's worth it, but if you didn't want the piercer feat, I don't think it's going to end up being a big deal. So mathematically, what does it do? So the math is a little bit complicated. Uh, this is kind of what we do when we're using something like great weapon fighting as well. Uh, so whenever there's a result that shows up on a die that we are definitely going to re-roll, then when we're working out the average for that die, we would just use the average result of a die roll for those results. And then 5 is still a 5, 6 is still a 6, 7 is still a 7, 8 is still an 8, because we wouldn't re-roll those results. Then we take the total, and we divide by 8, and that gives us our new die average, which is now 5.5. That's only on the first attack. It's actually less on the second attack, because we might use the piercer feed on the first attack, in which case we can't use it on the second attack and then our critical damage doubles. In the end, this is not going to be a huge increase to our damage, uh, but it will be an increase to our damage. It's going to increase by about 1.5 to 1.6 uh, from taking the piercer feet. That 
does go up a little bit as we go up in level, um, but that's what it is right now. Then comes a big level, level 7. First thing we get is Magic Arrow. At 7th level, you gain the ability to infuse arrows with magic. Whenever you fire a non-magical arrow from a shortbow or longbow, you can make it magical for the purposes of overcoming resistance and immunity to non-magical attacks and damage. The magic fades away from the arrow immediately after it hits or misses a target. Without this, the fighter has a concern. And maybe the DM is nice and just hands you the weapon you need. And if you're using a hand crossbow, let's face it, the DM is specifically throwing that bone to you. Because I am unaware of any published adventure where there's a magical hand crossbow. The other possibility is maybe you have an artificer in your group. If you have an artificer in your group, they can just hand you the magical weapon you need. And then you're taking charity from the other party members, and that's great. If they're willing to help you out, that's terrific. That's what teamwork's all about. But what if you don't have an artificer in your group? Or you do have an artificer in your group, but other party members need those magic items as well. Well, the Arcane Archer is covered. So that's another reason why you might want to consider Arcane Archer for your next Fighter Archer character. The big thing, though, that the Arcane Archer gets at level 7 is Curving Shot. At 7th level, you learn how to direct an errant arrow towards a new target. When you make an attack roll with a magic arrow and miss, you can use a bonus action to re-roll the attack roll against a different target within 60 feet of the original target. Now, when this was first published, there was some question whether the magic arrow feature of the Arcane Archer actually converted non-magical arrows to magical for the purposes of using Curving Shot. Because Curving Shot says, when you make an attack roll with a magic arrow. Did you need plus one arrows for this to work? The designers have clarified, no, magic arrow is definitely what you need in order to use Curving Shot. So once you get Curving Shot at level 7 and you get magic arrow at level 7, basically all your shots qualify for Curving Shot. So this is an important feature for the Arcane Archer uh, because at this point, we don't have a lot we can do with our bonus action. And now we have something we can do with our bonus action and it should come up in most of our turns because if we're attacking twice and we're using Sharpshooter, the odds that we're going to miss at least once is over 80%. And when we get more attacks, it's even going to be higher than that. And if the Arcane Archer didn't get this feature, then if we want to be optimal, we would need to find something to do with our bonus action. And there, there's things we could do. I mean, we could choose a race that has a good bonus action option. Something like a goblin is a good example. Uh, or we could do a multi-class where we get something reliable we can do with our bonus action. But because the Arcane Archer gets Curving Shot at level 7, we don't need to worry about that. This is a reasonably good bonus action. Now, I am not going to be dishonest here. There is no question that if we could make our bonus action attack at the same creature we're already attacking, that is a tactically superior option. Because if you are concentrating on an enemy, that's the enemy you want to do damage to. So let's not pretend that this is as good as attacking the same creature again. But that said, since we're not using our bonus action, attacking a different creature and doing some damage to them is still a reasonable use of our bonus action. And it's a heck of a lot better than not doing anything with our bonus action. And what it does do is it vastly increases the damage this character can do. So assuming a bonus action attack, 80% chance, that adds about 7.63 to our DPR, leaving us at 28.46. That is 72% over the baseline of 16.5. That's good damage. To compare, if a fighter was to take crossbow expert and sharpshooter and otherwise following the same path as this character, they would be looking at 23.1 damage. That is more than five below. So that is a significant difference. Battle masters, they have those extra maneuvers where we only have two arcane shots. Our arcane shots are really, really good but they have more uses of their maneuvers. And so they probably still have an advantage over us, but I think at this point, it's not a big advantage anymore. My goal here is not to convince you that the Arcane Archer is better than the Battlemaster at archery, because frankly, I'm not convinced that's the case. But I do think there are reasons why you might consider Arcane Archer, so I'm hoping those are becoming apparent. 
Now, I'd love to tell you that lots of stuff happens at level 8, 9, or 10, but it doesn't. So we're going to go right to level 11. We get an ability score improvement at level 8, and so we will go ahead and take an ability score improvement, and we're going to increase our dexterity. That's going to get our dexterity right to 20, and then we're going to increase our intelligence. That's going to increase our intelligence to 17. Now, you do have another option here. With fighters, I generally like to take the resilient feat at some point. Uh, because we are proficient in constitution saving throws, we would like to be proficient in dexterity saving throws and wisdom saving throws. We're not going to be proficient in both of them regardless. So we probably want to be proficient in one of them. We could take resilient dexterity here. That would also get our dexterity up to 20. And then we would have the proficiency in dexterity saving throws. I'm going to hold off and I'm going to take resilient in wisdom a little later on in this character. I generally like wisdom saving throws a little bit more than dexterity saving throws. They're both very good. Uh, so that's the way I'm going. But if you wanted to go with the dexterity saving throws, I'd take resilient dexterity here instead. At level 9, we get indomitable. This allows us to re-roll a saving throw if we fail. One thing I'll mention about indomitable is if you didn't have a good chance to succeed in the first place. So let's say this character had to make a charisma saving throw. Well, we had a minus one on that saving throw. And if the DC was 17, which is not unrealistic at this level, then we didn't have a very good chance of succeeding. If we use our Indomitable after we fail, we're probably just going to fail again. When you really want to use Indomitable is when you made a saving throw that you had a good chance of succeeding. So if this character was to make a Constitution saving throw or a Dexterity saving throw, they're much better at those. So if they fail and they re-roll, they have a reasonable chance of success. The other thing to note about Indomitable is most fighter features are regained after short rests. This one is not. Level 11 is notable, though, because when you are a fighter, your extra attack scales. Fighters are the only class where extra attack scales. So we're going to get three attacks with our longbow using our attack action, plus probably secondary damage with our bonus action. Our chance of hitting with all three attacks is less than 10%, so we're almost always going to be able to use that bonus action. Though I should say that in some combats, of course, there's just one opponent, or maybe it's the last opponent. And once that happens, well, then we're not going to be able to use Curving Shot at all in those cases. And at level 10, we get another Arcane Shot option. And here's where I will recommend Enfeebling Arrow. This is the one does an additional 2d6 necrotic damage. They make a constitution saving throw. If they fail, their weapon attack damage is halved until the start of our next turn. But in terms of DPR, we're adding an arrow, and an arrow should be doing about 9.55 damage. Our action surge damage goes up as well because we're doing an additional arrow with our action surge as well. In the end, we end up with 40.48. That is a 49% increase over our baseline of 27.15. Uh, so I'm throwing a lot of numbers out there, but just consider the difference. Every single round, doing 27 points of damage or doing 40 points of damage. If we went crossbow expert and sharpshooter at this point, we'd be doing 32.84 damage. So we're doing a lot more damage than the crossbow expert at this point. Now the crossbow expert is going to close that gap. The reason why they're a little bit further behind right now is because... If you're going to go with hand crossbow, you basically need two feats. You want crossbow expert and sharpshooter. And with the arcane archer, we only really need the one feat, sharpshooter. So the uh, crossbow expert slash sharpshooter is uh, ability score bonuses behind. Now, the, the reason why that eventually doesn't become a factor is because fighters get enough ability score increases that eventually they have more than they need. So eventually that extra feat requirement is no big deal but until you catch up on the 20 dexterity uh, then you are a little bit behind the arcane archer using the longbow will always from this point be doing more damage though furthermore it doesn't take into account the fact that the arcane archer is guaranteed magical attacks and it doesn't take into account the fact that the arcane archer is going to have five times as much range so more damage, more range, more reliable attacks, and battlefield control. Now, I just want to make sure I'm being clear, because 
I'm not saying that the Arcane Archer is a better archer than any fighter that takes Crossbow Expert. These numbers I'm showing, I'm basically not using a subclass because that was the claim I had yesterday, was that if you're an Arcane Archer, you basically need to take Crossbow Expert and use a hand crossbow and be a subclassless fighter because that's better than taking the longbow. And I don't think that holds any water, and that's the comparison I'm making. But you know what? If I'm a different kind of fighter, it's a different story because then I am getting subclass features. Those might enhance doing Crossbow Expert. And I've been talking about Battlemaster, but other subclasses too can do things to make Crossbow Expert work better. And that's not the comparison I'm making here. I'm just showing that if you are an Arcane Archer, Longbow is your best bet. And it does work reasonably well. But I don't want to suggest that Arcane Archer is the best archer in the game. I don't think it is. If I did think it was, Arcane Archer would have been ranked a whole lot higher than I ranked it. So let's go to level 15. Uh, and then from 15, we're going to jump right to level 20. We'll get an ability score improvement at level 12. I'm recommending at this point to pick up Resilient Wisdom. There may be a way to slip it in there earlier if we skip the piercer feat. Uh, that would have been an option as well. But we definitely want it at some point. So I'm going to grab it here at 12. Then at 14, another ability score improvement. This is going to be now a way to increase our intelligence some. So we're going to take telekinetic intelligence. Telekinetic has all kinds of uses. One of those uses will be if you have a grasping arrow effect on somebody. You can use telekinetic to deliver automatic damage. And of course, there's lots of other ways to use telekinetic, especially if you have control casters in your group. Now, since level 7, we've had a fairly reliable way to use our bonus action. What telekinetic does is it ensures we will always have a way to use our bonus action. So if we, for example, hit with all our attacks, well, then we could use telekinetic with our bonus action. Or if it should happen that we miss a creature and there's no other enemy within 60 feet, that also gives us something else we can do with our bonus action. And we will get another arcane shot selection. I am moderately recommending shadow arrow. Each time I'm taking one of these arrows, there's less frequency in which I can see using it. I mean, grasping arrow is what I'm using most of the time. It is, like I said, far and away the best arrow. The other arrow I could see using a reasonable amount of time is Banishing Arrow, which is still pretty effective, but it does provide that saving throw. The rest of the shots, just a kind of once in a while thing. It's okay to have them, but I wouldn't expect to use them very much, uh, and some of them may not get used at all. Here's the big thing that happens. We get Ever Ready Shot at level 15. Starting at 15th level, our Magical Archery is available whenever battle starts. If you roll initiative and you have no uses of Arcane Shot remaining, you regain one use of it. This is the first time we actually get additional Arcane Shots. And the best way to make use of this, we don't have very many uses to begin with. We only have two uses. So I would probably just use them both in the first combat. And then I'm going to have one Arcane Arrow every single combat after that. I think that's the way to go. It's not worth conserving it, so you can have two shots in a more important combat. If we're doing an important combat, you can hit the big enemy, throw probably a grasping arrow at them, and that's going to be pretty effective. But in terms of how I calculate damage, ever ready shot basically is going to give us three additional shots because I'm assuming four combats between short rest. Now, if you are having less combats between short rests, then this doesn't give you as many arrows. On the other hand, if you have less combats between short rests, you've had a lot more arcane shots all the time. So you're actually better off that way. But if you are having those long adventuring days, then every ready shot is definitely going to come in handy. So at level 15, our DPR, we now have five arrows per short rest with my calculations. So that is going to add to our damage. We're going to end up with a DPR of 43.11. That is 59% over the baseline of 27.15. So that's still a fair bit up. Uh, and Crosswell Expert is at 39.03. So they have, like I said, closed that gap, but haven't completely shut that gap down, nor will they.
and going from level 15 to level 20. Uh, the first thing that will happen is we will get a final arcane shot. That will be, I am going to recommend Seeking Arrow. That's the one that can hot, find something that's hidden. Again, not expecting to use this a lot. Should also mention when we get to 18th level, the damage for all these is going to increase. Things like Banishing Arrow actually do damage. Um, now, with Grasping Arrow, this is pretty good because we're getting an increase to the poison damage, but we're also getting an increase to the slashing damage. Two ability score improvements, one at 16th and one at 19th. At 16th, we'll maximize our intelligence score. So the intelligence score is now 20. That maximizes the DC on all our arrows. And then the ability score at 19th, eh, let's just increase our constitution. That helps our saving throws and going to give us some more hit points. Then at level 20, we get our final extra attack, and that extra attack means we're making four arrow attacks with our attack action, and then we have a bonus action on top of that. Also, it helps our action surge because now we can fire four arrows with our action surge. Our level 20 archer is doing 57.08 DPR. That is a 61% over baseline of 35.4. So once again, just think about it. Think about playing the game and doing 35 points of damage and that being an okay amount. 57 is going to feel like a lot more. The crossbow expert is doing 51.1. So we're doing more damage than a fighter with crossbow expert and a hand crossbow. Again, if you are certain subclasses of fighter, so maybe you've taken battle master and using precision strike to hit with more arrows, that number will be higher. It'll be not that much higher than this though. So the Arcane Archer, I think it does struggle. I mean, it struggles from levels one through six because its abilities, number one, they don't get enough shots. And honestly, I think the shot should probably scale at the same point in which they gain a new shot. So you should probably get a third shot at level seven and you should probably get a fourth shot at level 10 and a fifth shot at level 15. But that's not the way it works. You stick at two shots right until level 15, and then suddenly you jump up to five. That is poor scaling, and that's unfortunate. The second thing is you do struggle from the fact that you're not using crossbow expert and a hand crossbow, and you struggle with that right until level seven. Once you get to level seven, it's not a struggle anymore because you have higher base damage, you have higher range, and you have a fairly reliable bonus action that is actually doing more damage than the crossbow expert one 80% of the time. So the Arcane Archer, do I think it is the best archer in the game? I think it is a pretty good archer once we get above level seven. I'm not sure I'd go as far as the best archer in the game, but do I think you're gonna contribute effectively? Here is the DPR graft. The red represents the baseline. The green represents a fighter taking crossbow expert and sharpshooter and the blue represents the Arcane Archer. We can see the point where the blue line springs ahead, level seven, and it stays ahead right into level 20. But the blue line is always above the red line. Level seven is the first point where it is a big gap, and it stays a pretty big gap again, right into level 20. So the Arcane Archer is an effective damage dealer. It is an okay damage dealer up to level six, and then a very effective one from level seven and then we're adding on some battlefield control. So I think the Arcane Archer does just fine. And if I'm gonna make a fighter and I'm gonna make an archer, well, then I'm gonna be thinking about what level I'm playing. Because if I'm playing from levels one through six, Arcane Archer probably isn't my first choice. From level seven, it's definitely on my list. So what do you think? Let me know in the comments down below. Otherwise, until next time, I'm gonna sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D &D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon.